to the second of our four 30th anniversary lectures. I just want to remind you that on March 8th, we're uh, welcoming uh, uh, Scott Harrison in what promises to be potentially our largest, uh, our largest speaker event uh, in recent memory, uh, at least. And then Joel Fleischman will be joining us on March 22nd. Uh, 20 28th, I believe. Is that 28th? March 28th? I 22nd. Can't, I can't read my own handwriting. 22nd. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the question for me was, 30 years from now, what will our successor and those of your student, us, those of you who are students, when you come back in 30 years as alumni, what will you think of the people we invited to mark the 30th anniversary of um, our school? And uh, one of the things you'll wonder is, what, what did we do to address the social and political ferment of our day? And I'm very pleased that uh, we, we have somebody who can help uh, provide some context on that uh, as well. Um, a foundation leader who has engaged this um, issue in, in uh, this intersection between philanthropy and public policy very directly, um, both through his previous scholarship but now his work as, as the president of a foundation, that in addition to the particular initiative that he will speak about has played a very important role in nurturing the philanthropic infrastructure in our country over the years. So um, I just want to also uh, mention the importance of uh, philanthropy to our republican and constitutional uh, traditions, if you will. I think uh, um, scholars, including our current speaker, has talked about that as part of our civic religion in this country. And I think many of us at our school believe that philanthropy plays at least a supporting role in this process as well, that voluntary action for the public good, as we like to think about it, plays a role in occasionally sustaining our political, civic religion, and on, on occasion, if you're lucky, perhaps even providing some inspiration on how to help it continue and, and perhaps recover itself or even reach um, uh, higher plateaus. So I'm very pleased that we have uh, this particular topic to uh, engage us on our 30th uh, uh, anniversary talk. So um, I would just uh, um, uh, like to say a few words about our speaker. Uh, he has been the president of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation since 2012. Under his leadership, the foundation has maintained its commitment to areas of enduring concern while ad adapting its approaches and strategies to meet changing circumstances and to seize uh, new opportunities. He has at the same time been instrumental in launching new efforts to respond to pressing and timing problems uh, such as challenges related to political polarization and cybersecurity. And I would venture to say that the initiative that you'll speak about today has been the signature issue of his at least the early tenure of his presidency at the Hewlett Foundation. Before the foundation, uh, Larry served as uh, the Richard E. Lang Professor of Law, uh, Professor of Law and Dean of the Stanford uh, Law School. Uh, at the start of his career, he served as law clerk to U.S. Court of Appeals Judge Henry Friendly and uh, of the Second Circuit and U.S. Supreme Court Justice William uh, Brennan, Jr. Uh, following his clerkship, he served as Professor of Law at the University of Chicago and University of Michigan Law Schools. He joined the faculty at NYU School of Law in 94, where he served uh, as Associate Dean for Research and Academics and Russell D. Niles Professor of Law until he left for Stanford. He was also on several boards, including the National Constitution Center, Independent Sector, and the Climate Works Foundation. He received his A.B. in Psychology and Religious Studies from Brown University and also his J.D. from University of Chicago Law School, both magna cum laude. He will speak to us today on fixing Congress before and after at the 2016 election, of course. Please join me in welcoming Clara Kerman. So except for that part about like 30 years, are you going to look back and think about the speaker? That's like too much pressure for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so um, instead, I didn't prepare, I, I could have. I actually have a talk on this. But rather than sort of deliver a prepared talk, I thought what I'll do is um, walk you through the experience as we had it and have had it and continue to have it. Uh, in terms of dealing with the, the problems of the dysfunctions of American democracy. Um, and uh, so for me, this started actually, it was very much a part of why I, I went to Hewitt. I mean, part of what I talked to some people earlier today was, uh, you know, I've been dean for about eight years. Ten years is about the half-life of, of a decent deanship, just so you know. <laughs> living on borrowed time. And, and so I was thinking of uh, things that I might want to do next, and Hewlett was appealing. I knew a lot about it. 
But when I was going through the interview process, you know, one of the things the board asked me was, oh, you know, oh, by the way, I should say, if you have questions as we go along, just ask them. We'll do it that way rather than like saving today, because I'm going to talk for a long time, and I don't believe in slides. <laughs> so I need to keep you engaged. Um, so anyway, so, you know, one of the questions I got asked was, so what do you think about what the foundation does? You know, and, and you know, my answer was, I love what the foundation does. I didn't know anything about any of it at the time. That was part of the attraction, actually, was all those new things to learn about. But I said to them, look, it seems to me as I look at the five or six problems that the foundation is currently addressing, you've got, you know, five or six of the 20 or so problems that can plausibly claim to be in the top 10. And, you know, I think it's hard to do better than that. Um, but, you know, I said, you're missing one, it seems to me, because almost all of the work the foundation does, uh, in one form or another, is meant, it requires moving public policy. And if you can't move public policy because the government has become completely dysfunctional, you know, then you're just wasting your time and money. And even if we're getting something done, it's a lot less at a lot more expense than it ought to be. So we ought to be working on this other problem, which undergirds so much of what we do, which also is a problem in its own right of considerable interest. Now, the truth was, that for me was one of the real allures of making the move. My academic writing, if you look at it, it looks like it's about courts. Well, it was about courts. But, but for me, the underlying interest and the reason I was always interested in courts was what are the conditions that it takes to make popular government work? And courts were a good site for that in the U.S. because we give them all this very strange, pop that's a different talk. I'm not going to get to that talk, but if you ever want to really get a talk on the courts, it's still my favorite talk. But, you know, it was, and, and there were stories about how politics was supposed to work that really had been seemingly followed pretty well for a long time. Um, the 2006 and 2008 elections were both right on schedule for the kinds of turnovers that you expected in normal American politics. And then the 2010 election happened, and that didn't fit at all. And what happened after 2010 made even less sense. And it made me think, maybe a, we, I, have been misinterpreting all this stuff that's been going on. Events are always flabby enough that they're subject to multiple interpretations. And maybe the conventional interpretation, which you could fit into the story up to at least 2010, isn't quite right. So it's like, let's go back and take a look and, and see what's going on. And actually, to my surprise and delight, I think the board was, they, they, they bought it. <laughs> um, so they hired me. And so I actually, the very first week I got there, in addition to all the other stuff, I started thinking about and working on, on this problem. Um, and, the, and the initial, you know, the initial diagnosis, I mean, was the problem was, we call it polarization. But polarization isn't actually the problem. Polarization is the consequence. It's, it's the thing that we see that is caused by the problem. It's the effect or the consequence. But the problem itself really, I think, and thought, and still think, was best understood as an inability to compromise within our major political institutions. Okay? And, you know, just stepping back, um, as I said, I was a constitutional historian that actually was the stuff. And, you know, uh, compromise is one of the central values in the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's not some betrayal of principle. It actually is the central to the, to the capacity of a democracy to function at all, and particularly the American democracy. I don't know how many of you remember your Federalist 10, but you know, Federalist 10, James Madison's famous paper, is you know, in some sense the core uh, articulation of the theory underlying the Constitution. And, and the core idea is what we're going to do is we're going to take this republic and we're going to make it really big. And we're going to make it really big specifically in order to take in all sorts of different interests. And so that we'll have a population filled with people who have different ideas and beliefs and passions and commitments and interests. And then we're going to create a process that forces them all to come to agreement on how they're going to govern together. So, so at the very heart of the Constitution and the constitutional process is the notion that we expect ideological disagreement, that there's supposed to be ideological disagreement, and that we have a system that's set up to achieve compromises that we can all live with, within it. And that's the very definition of Republican government. Um, now, and suddenly we were living with a system in which it wasn't happening anymore. And in fact, people are running for office proudly declaring that they will never compromise, that the one thing they will not do is order with the other side, and that that was an increasing, and, and you were seeing the effects of it. Um, so you don't want to necessarily say the measure of how well Congress is doing is how many laws it passes. Right? It, there could be bad laws, too. But, but you know, the extent of the drop-off, you know, there was a Congress in the Truman era called the Do-Nothing Congress that was about 10 times as productive as the Congresses in the 2012-2014 in the years. So we were talking about such a precipitous drop 
in, in Latin, and with the obvious consequences that we were seeing, which was increasing disaffection and increasing alienation within the polity at large. Okay, now, there's, I think in my mind at least, um, I would say it's pretty clear that that was not because of ideological disagreements. Let's say there are ideal, ideological disagreements between people on the left and people on the right. There have always been ideological disagreements between people on the left and people on the right, but the ideological dif distance between the two sides is not larger than it's been in the past. In fact, it's actually smaller than it's been through most of American history, and certainly smaller than it's been through periods in which we nevertheless managed to govern perfectly well, get what needed to be done done, move along with a public that was largely embracing of the institutions, that you didn't see the kind of huge, precipitous drop in faith uh, that we've seen uh, in the American public. One small technical piece. If you read about these things in the newspapers, they actually the, the sort of conventional wisdom of the public is that it is because ideological differences have become so big. And you see those graphs where they show every Democrat is to the left of every Republican, and you know, and they show the movement. And that's all true, but the measure they're using for that is something called DW nominate scores. And what those are is those are the actual votes in Congress as opposed to what the members might want to do. So so there is this separation, but it's though the DW nominate scores are a reflection of the consequence, not the cause. Okay? And and in fact part of the diagnosis was members in Congress have less freedom to do what they might otherwise do. It's not the case that every member of Congress is voting his or her conscience and this is just what they want to do. It's that for a whole variety of reasons, they're being for if you're a party discipline, in other words, had increased enormously in both parties, so that you know, instead of looking at votes that covered a pretty broad spread, it had gotten very narrow, and, and it looked like the median had moved to the left for the Democrats and to the right for the Republicans, but, but the, the, as an actual reflection of where their ideologies uh, were, that wasn't necessarily uh, an accurate uh, explanation. Okay, so then it's like, well, how, do you, how did this happen? Where did that, why did that happen? And again, one of the other... Uh, there's so much, you know, like I feel like a big part of my job is like, con I hate conventional wisdom, right? Because it's almost always wrong. Um, and which is weird because it's conventional, so you think it would be wrong, but at least in politics, and most of, so much of the conventional wisdom comes from pundits. Because there is actually a lot of difference between what you read in the newspapers and if you actually spend the time to go look at the social science literature, what you'll find. I'll touch on a few of those. Um, but you know, one of the sort of conventional wisdom is that this problem is itself relatively recent, either from Obama's election or from Bush's election or from Clinton's election, when in fact you can trace the roots of it all the way back to the 60s. Um, and I, I think of it as actually kind of analogous to climate change. So the conditions that are producing climate change begin back in the 19th century. Um, but we don't really start to see that they're happening all along, but they don't rise to the level where we start to see the change until relatively recently. And that's also true for the way politics has evolved. So the real roots of this um, lie in the civil rights era, and, the, and in particular the civil rights laws passed in 64 and 65, two phenomenally important pieces of legislation, in some ways maybe two of the most important pieces of legislation in American history, but they did create a new dynamic. Particularly, the dynamic, you know, it is ironic to think that so much of the ability to compromise, not ironic, maybe sad, uh, so much of the ability to compromise across the 20th century was a product of the willingness of, Democrat, of, of Southern conservatives to stick with the Democratic Party because they still hated the Republicans because of the Civil War. Right? They were not going to vote Republican under any circumstances until the Democrats backed the civil rights legislation, and that created an opportunity that the Nixon campaign exploited quite intentionally, quite openly, to appeal to conservative Southern Democrats to vote Republican. And that starts a process that does not happen in a day. But the resorting of conservatives and liberals, who used to have a fair amount of ideological diversity within both parties. Now, let me, there's going to be lots of asides here and aside there. It was not the case, other than the Southern Democrats, that hardcore conservatives were Democrats or hardcore liberals were Republicans. It was the case that people who were mostly liberal would be Democrats and mostly conservative would be Republicans, but that lots of them had lots of positions. I'm a generally a conservative, that's why I'm a Republican, but I hold a lot of positions that are liberal. I'm generally liberal, that's why I'm a Democrat, but I hold a lot of positions that are conservative. In other words, it's not that, people are not that simple, right? I hope. Uh, life is just too complicated to be so pure in, in your ideology if you're really being thoughtful in the real world. Uh, but what happens is, 
over time, whatever your dominant position is, you start to move. So those conservative Southern Democrats begin to shift over to the Republican Party. As they do so, the Republican Party itself becomes more conservative on the whole and less hospitable to the, to the people who had lots of liberal positions in the Republican Party. And they begin to shift back to the Democrats. So that over time, you do reach a point where there's been a sorting. Pretty much everybody who identifies as a liberal fundamentally is going to be a Democrat. Everybody who identifies as a conservative is a Republican. And that is true today. They haven't gotten farther right or farther left, but, but the sorting is, is all but complete. And that takes place, as I say, over a really long period. Um, it's not really complete into well into the 90s, uh, during, during really the Clinton elections, uh, or when you see it um, uh, really come home. Um, as that happens, other, other effects begin to take place. Uh, and they, they have a, a similar effect. So, for instance, uh, within Congress, well, so a second effect that takes place is the country itself turns out to be, when you divide it that way, pretty closely divided. Like, really close. We see that. Not within any, many states and localities are overwhelmingly one party or the other party now, but when you aggregate at the national level, it obviously, as we've seen in these last few elections, exceptionally close. And what that means is, in any given election, particularly in Congress, it's within shot to retake one or both houses. Okay? And what that does is it means if I'm a party leader, I, I, what I care about is holding my house or regaining my house. Right? And so as, as all of this begins to take place within Congress, the leadership begins to suck more and more power up to the top to weaken the committees and, and a lot of the lower levels where people have been willing to... If I'm a member of the banking committee, you know, I may be a Republican, I may be a Democrat, whatever I am. I, I'm, I'm, I know about banking. I put a lot of time and effort into understanding banking. I want to do something about banking. That's why I'm on the banking committee, and so I'm willing to compromise. Suddenly, I don't have that power anymore. It's been put up at the leadership level, and they're not interested in that because they're focused on winning the next election. Every two years, that's what they have to focus on. So, so you have that power drift to the top and a less and less willingness on the part of the people at the top to leave room for compromises because they're so focused on elections. So there's a whole set of dynamics. And then, of course, they begin to do things about that inside Congress. Right? If the committees aren't really doing this kind of work anymore, they don't need those kinds of resources. And so they begin to strip away the resources inside Congress. They get rid of the Office of Technology Assessment. They shrink the staffs by more than 30% and so on. Um, all of which then makes Congress still weaker. Now, what do I do if I'm a member of Congress? If I need information about something, I don't have the capacity to get it from my own staff or from an office inside the Congress. I'm going to depend on the lobbyists who are feeding me the information. And on and on and on. So you have all of these developments taking place over a 30-year period in which increasingly the members of Congress are given and have less and less space to, to compromise and to move outside of what, of what their party leadership wants. So that was how we diagnosed the problem. Um, and one other point I'll make, which is as we diagnosed it, we, we determined that the, the core institution here that was both the source of the problem and could be the source of the solution was Congress. Um, and there's, there's some assumptions there, really three that I'll mention. So one is Congress is a uniquely important institution in the American political system because it's really the only institution in which national interests can be aggregated in a democratic way. You can't do that at any state level because it's limited to the state. And you can't do that in the executive because there's only a president or in the Supreme Court because there's only nine of them and they're supposed to at least be paying attention to law. Congress is really the one branch that's set up to represent and reflect all of the interests in the country and do that, you know, that compromising and aggregating and working out things process that, that, that Madison was writing about the Federalist Ten. Second, if you actually look at it, um, polarization started in Congress and has spread down and out. And you can see this if you track polls about it. The Pew Research people have been tracking this for years, but others as well. The, the sort of what I'll call bad behavior, what I'll call bad behavior, drop the what I'll call, the bad behavior starts in Congress and then it's getting picked up increasingly uh, in other parts of the government, at the state and local level, and out in the population generally. And so when people always talk about we can still get things done at the state level or the people themselves are more centrist, that's true, but decreasingly so, and that's only because of this lag. And that's because, and this is the third assumption we made, leadership actually matters a lot in a democracy. Political leadership is, of course, responsive to you know, what the polity seems to want, but the polity is following political leadership, particularly when it comes to political behavior. And so, you know, they start acting badly in Congress, they start 
talking badly about and to each other, and that be increased their, now this is exacerbated enormously by changes in the media and the emergence of fragmented partisan media who really are out there amplifying this stuff, I'll come back to that, but in any event, it's a top-down problem, and so the, our theory of change was that the best way to go at it is a top-down solution. If we can get the people in Congress to start behaving like grown-ups again, we stand a chance of beginning to heal the American system. If you try and do this bottom-up through some sort of grassroots approach, you're doomed before you start. That's just not the way democratic politics actually works when it comes to these kinds of issues. So with that in mind, after about a year, we, I wrote a memo to the board saying, here's some ideas. We need to do something about this problem. And we need to do something, we really need to do something about this problem um, because um, as long as it continues, the disaffection and alienation will continue. In fact, one of the interesting, other interesting things about democratic politics, and again, there's a, a lot of social science research to support this, virtually no law becomes law without pretty strong bipartisan support. That's true today, it's always been true. The inability to get it is why we have no legislation happening. The very occasional law that gets passed with no bipartisan support finds extreme difficulty in achieving public acceptance. We see that also true today. Um, when bipartisan legislation is enacted, it achieves public acceptance, and people will actually go along with laws that they disagree with sooner and more than they'll go along with nothing. That inaction or one-party government is, is what is going to cause the continued corrosion, the continued disaffection, the continued alienation. Uh, and if we don't do something about this, I literally said in the memo, within, it was, uh, off the top of my head, 30 years, you're going to see the election of a demagogue. That is what happens in democracies when they stop working. So I turned out to be 26 years off on that. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it was literally the prediction uh, that we made. So we said, to the, we said to, the, to the board, so give us three years and some funding. We asked for $15 million a year. I, I put it out there and someone said to me, oh, so you're doing this for, for $45 million? I said, yeah, we, we asked the board for only $45 million. And Paul Brest, who I was with at the time, said, God, you've been in the foundation for a year, and you already said, only $45 million. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it said, give us three years to not, the problem we're pretty confident about, the question is whether we and philanthropy can do anything about it, because there's lots of problems we can't actually do anything about. So give us three years to answer three questions that we will come back with answers for. One is, are there solutions to this problem you know, that we think can be advanced? Two is, are there grantee organizations out there that we can fund to do it or create to do it? And three is, are there enough other funders who are interested in working with us on this because we alone couldn't even remotely imagine doing this by ourselves? And, and so the board said, fine, we'll give you three years. And that was the formally initially announced Madison initiative was this three-year exploration to see if we could come up with a solution to that, to that problem. Okay. Um, so three years took us to October of 2016. And in October of 2016, we wrote our follow-up memo to the board with a recommendation that we could do something about it. And I'll talk about what it was. That they give us, we said, you know, this is not a quick solution. We think 20 to 30 years, it will, it will take 20 to 30 years, but we're not going to ask you to make a 20 or 30 year commitment. Give us five years. We'll do this in five year chunks. But don't make that first five year commitment unless you're, you know, willing to think about continuing it for the 20 or 30 years that it's going to take. Um, and now we wrote that the, the board meeting actually where we were asking to approve this was on November 15th of 2016, but we had to send the memo ahead of time, so we finished it and sent it out in October. Um, okay. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, let's just talk about what we initially thought. Now, two of the questions were pretty easy. The, that first week when I said I started, when I got there, the first thing actually that I did was contact the presidents of um, 15 other large foundations that in one form or another were working in this space and proposed that we all sit down and have a meeting. And that first meeting, I then canceled that first meeting because <laughs> I realized like nobody was ready to collaborate yet and spent most of the the next year, my actual role was in laying the groundwork for the presidents to come together with some notion that we could and should work together. But, but you know, by three years, it was pretty clear we had actually put together an informal funder table. Uh, of, it's now about, uh, we've lost a couple and gained a couple, but it's now about 14 or 15 funders who meet episodically to compare notes and talk about what we can and should and are doing 
about this broad set of issues. We were committed and still are committed that that group has to be ideologically diverse, that there is no solution to this problem that is all conservative or all liberal. Um, that is actually, I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A, in some ways the most difficult part still of this because people on the left and the right don't necessarily agree with that assumption, although I will say people on the right are way better about it than people on the left. Um, but in any event, you know, it was easy enough to say the board, there are other funders, they are willing to work, even when we don't agree strategically, where we agree tactically, we can work together and so on. And we also found a number of grantees, actually quite a few really good organizations that were just beginning, because, you know, I mean, it's not like we were the only people who spotted this problem. So there was a lot of ferment in the non, uh, in the NGO world, and a lot of new organizations, many of which were actually really good. Uh, and had really good people in them. So, so those two questions were easy. And the hardest question was, yeah, but what are you going to do about it? And how are you going to solve this problem? Okay, so we, what we said to the board was, um, there are these big causes that we can't do anything about. Right? The, the sorting that has taken place is a product of, of political and cultural and social developments that philanthropy can't change. And we're going to need a resorting Right before this happens. It really is hard to get a whole lot done when, when you've got that sort of perfect all liberals, all conservative kind of thing. Not impossible, but really difficult, and we're going to need that to change itself. But that will change itself, because that's, that has actually happened all through American history. Um, we've had these kinds of issues before, and what happens is the issues change, and then people resort themselves. And we saw the beginnings of that in the 2016 election. Right, where you saw the beginnings of splits in both the Democratic and the Republican Party reflected in Trump on the Republican side and Sanders on the Democratic side, and issues in which actually not only was there disagreement within the party, but that there was agreement across. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, it didn't happen. That's not a quick process. It's not clear how it will play out because it always plays out differently. My favorite line about history is history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. <laughs> I love that. It really captures. So, so it's not clear just what this wine will look like, but you can see the beginnings of it. And the polarization has made it harder than it has been in the past, um, but, but eventually that's going to happen. The issues are going to keep changing. Um, the problem is, even as that happens, so many institutions and uh, structures have accreted to secure what we've got that it's going to be much harder to move things forward. And that is the place where philanthropy can play a role. So we can begin to change some of the political structures and institutions that are exacerbating and preserving the kind of polarization so that as conditions evolve to eliminate it, it will happen. And in the meantime, we can, in any event, make Congress better able to operate than it is now. So with that in mind, we basically identified three levers that we thought we could push on as a foundation, working with other funders, to actually move this system forward. And again, remember, this is October 2016. <laughs> So the first and the most important one was to facilitate changes inside Congress itself to make it more capable of operating well. So the, the chief place where the polarization had played out and really secured itself were the institutional changes inside Congress, of which I mentioned one, I'll mention, I'll re-mention and, and give you some. So the centralization of power at the leadership level, right? We needed to, we need to re-decentralize power back to the committee level. Um, the, uh, the work week. Right? So one of the key, you know, the, the work week in Congress is now you fly in Tuesday morning, you fly out Thursday evening. Uh, while you're there for those couple of days, you have no time to do anything except continue to fundraise and do your party business. So there was no relationships. There was no, you know, people, especially across parties, don't know each other. That makes it harder for them to work together and so on. Um, a third development. Uh, there were no internal resources for Congress to do the work that it needed to do. As I mentioned before, they were completely dependent on lobbyists for their information and so on. Um, a fourth development, there were a variety of rules that had been changed in various ways to make things harder. Let's, I'll give you the filibuster we all know about, but the way the filibuster was used itself had changed enormously. From, and that was because of the ease with which it could be done. So you went from having to actually filibuster, you still see that every once in a while, um, to, you know, to uh, having cloture votes, to, I'm sorry, that's where you end up, to, uh, you had to start your filibuster, but then you might have a cloture vote, 
to you know a system where we would just go straight to the cloture vote. And if you didn't have the 60 votes, then we pretended that you'd done the filibuster. And the number of filibusters went up because it wasn't just the final bill now, it was every stage in the process. And, and so on and so on. And then my favorite is the Haster. How many of you know what the Haster rule is? Okay, that's interesting. Uh, during the Clinton era, the Republican Party had adopted a rule that you should, which when Denny Hastert was the Speaker of the House, in which he said the Republicans committed to saying, no bill will come, when the Republicans are in the majority, no bill will come to the floor unless it has a majority of the majority party. But that rule had evolved under John Boehner to be, unless the majority that passes the bill finally is from the majority party. You see the difference, right? Suppose you have uh, 300 Republicans and 100 and 145, 145 Democrats, okay? So in the original Haster rule, if 145 Democrats were prepared to vote for something, you had to have 151 Republicans and then it would go to the floor. In the revised Haster rule, unless you had, what's half of 435, 218 Republican votes, it wouldn't go to the floor. The absolute majority had to be Republican. It turns into a filibuster rule. It means a minority of the majority party can block every piece of legislation, which they do all the time. That's why what you see is, like, the Freedom Caucus wouldn't have the power to do what it does under the original Hester rule. It does under the revised rule. And these changes happen almost without anybody being aware of them. Uh, my, one of my favorites, they used to not do roll call votes were done, you know, like, on paper only. They started doing them live so that members had to stand up and say what they were voting against. And each party would insist on roll call votes solely to embarrass members of the other party and get little snippets that they could use on, on TV against them in the next. And all this stuff then generated more ill will and so on. So there was a whole slew of internal things inside Congress that we thought need to change so that when politically these guys have a little space, they'll be able to do so. So we had found, believe it or not, grantees who could do this work, both uh, some outside Congress working closely with members inside Congress, some, like no labels, say, with members of Congress working in the organization, and so that was the, you know, it was a revision of rules, decentralization of power. I'll give you my favorite, to be honest, which we can't bring back earmarks by name, but earmarks were an amazingly useful tool. Right? The, the, the total cost, everybody know what an earmark is, you're passing a piece of legislation. The total cost of earmarks at the height of them was less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. But for that one half of 1%, you could get an enormous amount done because you could get members to put the interests of their state ahead of the interests of their party long enough to support a particular piece of legislation. Um, getting rid of them took away yet one more incentive that you could use to get party, to get members of Congress to think about just not sticking with the party. So there was a, a whole slew of things like that as well as um, rebuilding bipartisan relationships. So in the long run that meant restoring a five day work week. In the short run it meant running all sorts of breakfasts and meetings and sessions and trips where we could just throw members together. We tried to do as many of them as possible with families so that, you know, because there's nothing better than getting people together with their kids and spouses to begin to build real friendships. Not with the idea that any of this would be sufficient to solve the problem, but that it was necessary. It would be one of the conditions that would enable them to work together when other things happen. Second problem, won't surprise anybody, is campaign finance. Um, now, we diagnose the problem of campaign finance a little differently than most um, because, you know, again, the prevailing sort of sense is like these rich interests are coming along and they're buying candidates off and getting them to support positions that they wouldn't otherwise support. And there's actually no evidence for that whatsoever, and I don't think it's true. What campaign finance was doing to make this difficult was two things. One is they're spending 50 to 70 percent of their time fundraising. Okay? I, when I was dean, I spent 50% of my time fundraising. And one of the things I learned, apart from the fact that it didn't leave me as much time as I wanted to do anything else, was the truth of the matter is if I spend all my time with some group of people, I'm going to start to think like them. They don't need to buy me off. It's just, that's what happens it's psychologically. Um, and, and of course, you know, of course it was going to happen to members of Congress um, I'm doing that. Plus, of course, with 50, 70% of their time on this, they had no time to do anything else. They had no, it's hard work being a member of Congress. You're supposed to learn a lot of stuff. They had no time to do it. So again, they would be following a small leadership group that would be telling them what to do. Um, so campaign finance was something that we thought, oh, and, and the third effect, which is probably the most important one, is it's not what they vote for, it's what they don't do, right? It's that they will not support anything that their that moneyed interests that are behind them don't want. And that's easier to do. So 
it, it, uh, by the time you got all these interests there, the cumulative effect of them all is there's large groups to do nothing about everything. And we were seeing that play out. Now the problem with campaign finance, of course, on this first set, the solutions were pretty straightforward. The difficulty was finding grantees who could influence the, the rulemaking and the allocation of resources inside Congress. We felt we had those, although we expected it to take time. Campaign finance, there were lots of organizations that wanted to work on it, but we didn't have solutions. And in truth, we still don't exactly. That's partly because of the Supreme Court, which has so overread the First Amendment as to basically leave no space for regulation. Right? Now, the way, I, the, way, the way this works is, of course, money is speech. It's crazy not to think that money is speech within the First Amendment. It's the means you use to convey your ideas and positions. So to say that's not part of the First Amendment you know, would be, I don't know how you would do that. But, of course, speech isn't absolutely protected. We allow the regulation of speech when there's an appropriate government interest. And what the Supreme Court had done was basically limit the, the, the grounds on which you could regulate that speech to quid pro quo corruption, which is the one thing that isn't happening. As I said at the beginning, there's no evidence that someone's giving members of Congress lots of money to get them to push particular solutions for them. It's all much more subtle than that. And they don't recognize, for instance, to me, the fact that they have to spend so much time fundraising as a real practical fact on the ground is itself a legitimate reason for government <laughs> regulation. The government can't function. That seems to me a pretty good governmental interest. So we needed to think, and I, I will confess, this sounds awful, but you know, uh, when Justice Scalia first died, it was like, ah, we have a chance now. <laughs> I knew him well. He was my landlord when I was in law school. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there's nothing personal here. I actually, he was, in fact, as delightful a person as people often say to know. But he was a huge problem as a vote. And so the thought that, you know, there might finally be five votes, not to have the Supreme Court solve the problem, but to have the Supreme Court get out of the way so that we could find a political solution that would work. So that didn't work out, as you know. And so we still have that problem on campaign finance. To some extent, a really robust system of public financing would help, but only with the candidates. The independent expenditure side, which is protected by the First Amendment, even if the candidates said they would curtail their spending in exchange for public resources, isn't going to be changed. And as long as that's the case, we're going to continue to have some problems here. So, so we know campaign finance is a problem. We don't yet have a good solution to it. And we have to keep working on that. Um, before I talk about the third issue, let me say something that we determined was not an issue, which is gerrymandering. So most people assume, and this is maybe the biggest piece of conventional wisdom, that the real source of political polarization is gerrymandering. We have all these non-competitive districts, and therefore we're getting extremists from both parties in their, in their non-competitive districts. And in fact, uh, nobody in social science, by the way, believes that. This is all conventional wisdom in the punditry. And for good reason, and I'll just give you some of the evidence. So the easiest piece of evidence is the US Senate. The US Senate is every bit as polarized as the House. There's no gerrymandering for the Senate. They're all statewide elections. It suggests there's something else going on here. Better piece of evidence is uh, work that's been done. If you line up candidates from the most competitive districts to the least competitive districts, and then say, so how are they voting? How are they voting? The theory would be, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, um, as you get more competitive, they should move towards the center. That's the whole median voter theory. But if you look at the actual results, their votes are exactly the same on both sides. That is to say, candidates elected in the most competitive districts are not voting differently or behaving differently than candidates in the least competitive districts, which whatever is explaining why they're behaving as they are, it's not the gerrymandering. On top of that, there is actually a lot less gerrymandering than you would think. Most of the gerrymandering is because people have sorted themselves in terms of how they live. So the Democrats are packed into cities, and Republicans live out in the country, and the suburbs are somewhat mixed. And so you actually would have, so you get, as long as you're drawing your districts the way we always have around economic interests and so forth, the only way you're going to get competitive districts is to gerrymander. <laughs> If you don't gerrymander, well, the, they call it natural gerrymandering. The natural gerrymandering means you get overwhelmingly Democratic and overwhelmingly Republican districts because you're not paying attention to partisan politics. You're paying attention to where people live, to city lines, to you know, and so on. So, um, and of course, both sides do it. So there were a whole lot of reasons for us to think you know, gerrymandering is not the cause of polarization here. It is a problem. Gerrymandering, whether it's natural or not, means one party is overrepresented relative to the other party. But, you know, it's not going to help me to have an uh, overrepresented, if I care about polarization, right? This isn't about, like, oh, I'm, secret, I'm really a Democrat, so actually I don't care about polarization. What I want is Democrats. 
right? If that's my view, then I then I care about gerrymandering because I can get the Democrats more highly represented, and then and then inflexible Democrats will not compromise with Republicans and try and shove what they can through the Congress. But of course, neither side does very well. But if you care about polarization, then gerrymandering doesn't help you one way or the other. What does and what explains what? How do you explain them? Why don't members elected in more competitive districts move to the center? Why are they out there? And the answer is primary elections. Because, because you don't get to run in that general election unless you get through the primary. And to get through the primary, you have to get through an election in which 5 to 10% of the voters are showing up, which tend to be the most extreme activist members in each party. So it's very small electorates out at the extreme. The money in politics, which in the general election does not have a great influence because it tends to balance out on both sides, in the primaries has an enormous effect because it tends to be highly ideological. And, it, and with those small electorates, it doesn't take a whole lot of money to have a big influence. And it's the same thing with the media. The partisan media has, so in these primary elections, you were getting candidates who were, who were locked into, not that the positions were more extreme, but they were locked into the party's position and not capable of making any sort of agreement on the other side, or you were gonna get primaried in the next election and lose your seat. So your choice between a competitive and a non-competitive district was whether you were going to choose between an inflexible Democrat and an inflexible Republican, not because they themselves are personally inflexible, but because they didn't have a choice, or it was just the inflexible Democrat or just the inflexible Republican who was going to win the general election. So we need to do something about primary elections, and we, we have some thinking about that. Uh, there's a couple of solutions that I think are plausible and could make a big difference. The easiest one would be in Europe, they, they don't have formal primaries the way they do. They tend to have though, they have two levels of election. And they run them very close together, right? If you saw the last election in France, the first round took place, and then the second round took place, I think, a week later. And that tends to make those elections one event. And so people turn up for both of them. We run our primaries nine months or a year ahead of time. Nobody's showing up. They're not paying attention yet. So as simple a solution as just moving them much closer to the general election could make a huge difference. So could all, all sorts of other things. Uh, the other solution that we've been interested in, though, is also changing the structure of the election. So in, in many states, and historically, we've both had lots of multi-member districts. And we've had lots of uh, instances where people use things like ranked choice voting, where you vote for your number one, your number two, your number three, your number four. And if nobody gets a majority, you knock that bottom one off and go to the next person and so on. And that actually has a tendency to moderate elections because when I'm campaigning, I, I have to worry about wh whose number two choice am I as well, and whose number three choice am I, and it affects the whole campaign. So, And they just adopted that in Maine, they may adopt it in Alaska, and so on. So solutions like that at least were out there. So we said to the, basically said to the board, we think if you give us enough time pushing on these levers, combined with what other funders are doing in other fields, we can make a difference here. And as I say, our three levels were fix the inside of Congress, uh, uh, fix campaign finance, and fixed primary elections, okay? So as I said, that was October. Uh, the, the board meeting took place a week after the election. So, uh, you know, it was like, oh. <laughs> so we went into the board meeting and said, okay, look, just approve it, okay? And, and because we're, we're pretty sure we can make this work, and we'll come back to you in March on our next board meeting with what changes we think we need to make because of the election. But the truth was, our, the reason we, I felt comfortable saying that at least, our first reaction, and, and still was, was, you know, as I said, it was faster than expected, but it was pretty much on diagnosis. You know, the way we read the election was it had actually confirmed most of what we had just said to the board and had been thinking for a while in terms of what would happen, how the, how, what would happen in an electorate where the government had just ceased to do things that people accepted in any sense. Um, and... Uh, and it, but, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be enough. So we would need to do, so we needed to, why had it happened so much faster? And what did we learn from the actual happening of it? And by the it, what I mean is not that Donald Trump won the election. That's, the, again, the consequence or the effect. But the unraveling of normal politics, the unraveling of the way politics, the willingness of people to say, I'm going to vote for this person, not even because I necessarily agree with them enough, but because I want to see this whole goddamn system blown up, right? which is a really common thing. So, so how had we gotten to that point, and, and what did it tell us about, about what was going on? At the same time, you know, we recognized the whole let's blow it up thing, uh, particularly since it was also happening in other parts of the world. That also was something we needed to learn from. And in any event, there were some immediate things that were not necessarily 
on for our long-term strategy, but that we thought we should do something about. So we said to the board, we need some extra money um, to deal with some of the short-term, some short-term defense efforts. Um, and and I'll just, these are, I'll just mention them. We, we focused on two. So the first one was the census. Um, the census is pivotal for so much in American democracy. And here, this was not so much, we were a little concerned about what the Trump administration might do, uh, particularly after the guy who ran the census uh, resigned. But we were more concerned about what Congress wasn't doing about the census, which was funding it properly. Right, and putting in place conditions so that we could have a census count that we could rely on. Because in addition to representation, the census also determines the allocation of about $400 billion a year in benefits at the state and federal level. It also determines where school districts are placed, where daughter, water districts are. It means so much so that if you get that wildly off, you're going to really create problems for your democracy. So we thought we need to, do, we need to work on the census, and we, we put some funding into some organizations designed to do that. Second um, was the Pence Commission. So if you remember, right after the election, Trump uh, tweeted out that actually he'd won the popular vote if he didn't count the three or four million people who had voted fraudulently. So obviously the problem of in-person fraud is one that people have been studying forever. There's a huge amount of empirical research on this, all of which agrees, left and right, that actually there are many problems with the voting system. In-person fraud is not one of them. It's exceptionally rare. And in the very few cases where it happens, it's almost always accidental. Um, so I actually had a student at Stanford who got uh, prosecuted in Ohio uh, because he registered to vote there, and it turned out he couldn't. But that was true in Ohio law, but the information that they gave you when you went to the voter registration law didn't make that clear. So it was like that kind of thing. We got him off, I should say. Um, <laughs> although it took a lot of effort because it was all caught up in this polarization. Stanford law student out there. I got reamed on Greta Van Susterman. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, and so, you know, we were worried that the Pence Commission had been put together specifically in order to uh, create a justification for more restrictive uh, laws. It's, you know, the U.S., it's harder to vote in the U.S. than any other democracy in the world, which is itself kind of striking. And I don't have a problem, for instance, with voter ID laws myself, but they have to be coupled with then a system where you make it easy for people to get the ID that they need. Um, you know, and that's not what we were looking at. And so, uh, so far in truth, again, the evidence suggests that the restrictive voter laws that are out there have not really had much effect, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't make them much more effective. So we thought, you know, in as much as we know this is not true, we need to do something. Once the commission comes out with a report justifying this, then Congress can take that report and use it to enact legislation, and then we're really sunk. So what we did was we funded a, a communications operation that was linked with the scholars who had done this work so that every step as the Trump, as the Pence Commission met, whatever they did that day, we put out information to, about what, what we actually knew about it. Um, and that effort, I think, turned out to be successful. As you saw, they disbanded the commission, but they should have because it never had any business existing. But most of what we wanted to do wasn't really around that. You know, we were not part of the resistance, you know, I mean, the, the American people had done what the American people had done. The problem that we were looking at is, why did they do that? And what could we do about the dysfunction that led to, as I say, that a disaffection deep enough that people would vote for somebody because he was not qualified for the position. Um, and as I said, most of what we were doing, we thought we still, the problem is still Congress. We need to make Congress more functional. Um, we still have these problems with campaign finance and with primaries, none of that changes. But what did change was our, our understanding of the nature of the problem in Congress. And with that, our work has changed. So let me explain. There were basically two insights we took out of it. We had been talking about the need for bipartisan compromise like everybody else. Part of the reason we thought we need to rethink this was right after the election, the last thing anybody on either side wanted to hear about was bipartisan compromise. Right? I mean, it's like, it sounded namby-pamby, it sounded from some distant past. It didn't speak at all to today's realities. So we thought, oh, we better find some more, some different rhetoric. But then as we looked at it, we realized, you know what? Actually, it's not bipartisan with compromise that we're after at all. It's not bipartisanship we want. It's less partisanship that we want. And people, when they hear bipartisan compromise, people have some notion that there's a Democratic position and a Republican position, and what they're supposed to do is split the baby and do something nobody wants to do. Some centrist thing that doesn't speak to anybody. And that's, that's not it. That's never been it, and it's not what we want. Right? The way a functioning legislature, the way a functioning Democratic legislature works is 
Party matters. Most people vote their party most of the time, but not all of the time. Sometimes they depart because, in fact, they don't agree with their party on some issues. Nobody agrees with their party on every issue. Even in this Congress, nobody does. Right? So sometimes, whatever your other beliefs are, take, take precedence. And you have space to do that. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, you vote because you have expertise. I'm on the banking committee, or I'm on whatever committee it is. I have expertise in that area, and that has taught me something, and I want to do something, and so I'm willing to compromise for Sometimes it's because in my prior life I was a doctor, or I know a lot about this, and so I, I know that's their position, it's not right, I want to do something on it. Sometimes, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to put the interests of my state ahead of the interests of my party, whether it's motivated by an earmark possibility or not, I'm just, I'm going to do that, because in this vote I'm a representative of California or Indiana, not of the Republicans or the Democrats. And what that meant was on any given issue, although most people were voting their party, you could cobble together fluid shifting coalitions of people who in this case or for this piece of legislation were willing to think about doing something different. That is to say, people's political identities are plural. They're not unipolar. Now, what we had done through all this party discipline and control and primary elections and all was make it so that the members of Congress, even though they're not, have to act as if they're only Republicans or only Democrats, and that makes them like Catholics and Protestants in medieval Europe, and all they know how to do is kill each other. And so we need to find, in our, our frame, it's that we need to find a way to, to restore a place where members of Congress can have the kind of plural political identity that's necessary for a complex society's democratic legislature to work. So it's less partisanship, not bipartisanship, so that Congress can be effective. Second, the way we had been thinking about this earlier on was we were focused around the norm of compromise, right? Our, our theory was that the norm of compromise has eroded and we need to restore it. Coming out of the election and then thinking about all the things that had been done and all the things that happened after the election, we realized it's not just that norm, it's norms. It's all of them that are disappearing. So I mentioned earlier, you know, democratic politics presupposes ideological combat. But it's supposed to be like Fight Club. Right? How many of you, someone said people aren't going to get that reference. How many of you have seen the movie Fight Club? Okay, good. I thought so. I said, that. everybody's in the movie. Right? right? In Fight Club, they're, they're fighting each other. Whoever's fighting wants to win, but, but they're not trying to kill each other because they're part of a club. Or, you know, it's like Marquess of Queensbury rules for democracy. And those rules are all sorts of different kinds of rules. Some of them are etiquette rules. You don't scream, you lie at the president during the State of the Union, even if he's lying. Right? Some of them are process rules. You give the guy a hearing and a vote, even if you're going to vote against him. Some of them are substance rules, like here's one on the Democratic side. You don't take a complex, controversial issue like immigration and try and settle it in an executive order because you did shitty in the last midterm election and can't get a bill through Congress. All of those were just, other presidents had, you, it's not that it was illegal, none of those are illegal. They're all perfectly legal. Right? I think Obama's immigration orders was unquestionably con constitutional, but it's just Prior presidents did not use the executive order to settle that kind of political issue, with two exceptions. FDR did it during World War II, and Lincoln did it during the Civil War. I'm, FDR did it, I'm sorry, during the, um, the Depression, and Lincoln did it. So, okay, if you're in a Civil War, or you've got the Great Depression, maybe. But <laughs> short of that, when it's still ordinary political issues, you're not, and as each side has progressively over the years abandoned more and more of the norms that defined the Fight Club rules, or it became easier to abandon some more of them, and, and it's turned into win at all costs. And that's what we see in our politics today, right? I, I'm, you know, now, I will say, um, that process, as I say, started, starts in the late 60s, it begin, and it's been happening. Both sides have contributed. It's generally tracked. Uh, the party that doesn't control the executive is the one that's abandoning, so the Democrats began this push when Nixon was president, Republicans picked it up when Carter was president, pushed it a little farther. The Democrats took it much farther when Reagan was president. Although far in all these spaces is still nobody's noticing it much yet. These are all really internal rules. Um, uh, Reagan. Um, Clinton becomes president, and the Republicans took it another couple of steps. And now you begin to notice it for the first time. Um, you know, impeachment, for instance, right? Um, the Democrats then took it even farther under Bush. Most people don't remember that it's the Democrats under Bush who are the first ones to take the filibuster and say, we're just going to filibuster every single judicial appointment. That was a complete violation of norms. Or it's the Democrats under Bush who are the first ones to seriously threaten to use the, we won't raise the debt ceiling unless we get our way in budget negotiations. Now, they didn't go as far as the Republicans subsequently did. They backed down before the government got shut down. 
But it's been each side starting where the other one left off and pushing it so far. Now, the Republicans under Obama, though, really went to town, right? So by that time, it's, it's you know, it's, and, and we're, so I, I think, you know, it's hard not to look at the last 20 years or so and say, okay, the Republicans have been a little more responsible. They've been playing harder ball, you know, and they've really pushed this far. But as I said, on the one hand, you say both sides are contributing. In any event, where we are is at a place where, you know, uh, the politics has turned into a win at all costs. And as I say, I think the, the, to me, the nadir was the tax bill. Not for the substance. I think reasonable people can actually disagree on the substance. I have friends who I respect a lot who tell me that a lot of the hysteria in the media about the tax bill is just wrong. But the process, you cannot believe in democracy and say that that was anything other than a travesty, right? The willingness to just abandon any notion of deliberation, debate, research, anything, and just shove a bill through, that's a little scary for me because they got it through. So, so it was more important to get a bill through no matter how bad, no matter how little input you got, no matter who was going to be hurt by it. All that mattered was winning politically. That, that to us is a problem. And we'll see what the Democrats do, you know, how, how much they fight back. Now, weirdly, so how does that affect our work? Weirdly enough, it actually, the Democrats need to do this. This is the, what, what, the way, that it, this is the realization, which is, it's a game theory problem. Right? We, you have two sides who are in opposition to each other, and they have, over time, stumbled into cooperative norms that allow the game to proceed. And if you go back and study, I was a historian of the early republic. They, you know, at the, in the early republic, they did some really hinky things, because they hadn't yet figured out how to make democratic politics work. But once you figure it out, those norms, they evolve, but they need to be pretty sticky, and you can't be changing them. And you certainly can't be knocking them out as fast as we do. So in, in, in a game where you've got a cooperative system, if the cooperation breaks down, how do you find your way back to cooperation? Well, there's a pretty standard set of ideas there, which is the first thing is you have to play tit for tat until both sides realize nobody's going to win. So that's why, weirdly enough, it is really important for the, that's why I was so depressed, not that the Republicans did the tax bill, but that the Democrats didn't block it. Because the worst thing for us will be for either side to realize, actually, we can win this way. Since all we care about now is winning, if we think we can win this way, we're just going to keep doing it. So the Democrats need to actually be at least as hardball as the Republicans have been and win, so that eventually both sides come to realize, you know, nobody's winning. Now, when that happens, the second thing we know is nobody ever goes backwards. You never go back to the old rules of cooperation. You have to find your way to a new equilibrium. And that's where we think philanthropy actually has a role. Because what we can do is from the bottom up, then within Congress, it's Congress top-down solution, but within Congress, it's going to be a bottom-up answer. We need to help them rebuild norms of cooperative politics. And the way we're thinking about that is there are some places where we think that will happen. That when they have exhausted themselves, so I'll tell you what the three are in this year. The three that we're looking at are the budget process, the oversight process, and cybersecurity. And the reason is we know that members on both sides recognize we've got to do a budget and this is not working. Members on both sides know we need a better system for oversight, because this really is not working. We're just ceding power to the executive left and right. And cybersecurity, at least as of yet, is not totally politicized. And the idea is, in those three areas, when they've exhausted them, they're not going back to the old budget process, which is broken. But if, and we're working with grantees on both sides to develop a process that, both inside and outside Congress, like, hey, well, why don't you guys try this? And if they do and it works, then it becomes easier to do still more. Right? That that's the only way this is going to happen. So it depends on some stuff happening. But for us, it has changed the work that we're doing very much and that it's gotten us focused not just on those overarching rules that we started with, although those are still in our sights, but also on very particular areas in which we think we can build processes, rules for working together that they might be able to accept when they're ready and, and begin to rebuild this. Okay. Two last quick, there's no clock. No one's asking questions. But let me, let me talk two other things that we took out of the election that are add-ons. So that's the Madison Initiative. There's two other things, though, that we realized we need to do. One is we had initially looked at the media problem and, and recognized it. We had misdiagnosed it, and we decided that we couldn't do anything about it anyway. We initially uh, diagnosed the media problem as this. Fragmentation in the media has occurred. The problem is people are getting totally different information. And you can't compromise. You can disagree on principle, but you should at least be on the same page with respect to what the problem is, and they're not. And then we decided, well, we can't do anything about that because the media fragmentation is a product of market flow. We're not going to undo that. We're, there's no new New York Times coming up. So, 
So we'll have to count on these. You don't have to solve every problem. All problems are overdetermined. So we don't need to solve every, so every problem, every aspect of the problem in order to begin to make things better. So let's just leave that. Coming out of the election, it was clear to us, one, we misdiagnosed the problem, and two, it was worse than we thought. The misdiagnosis was, this is not a factual problem. It's not that people are getting different facts. It's that our media system has turned into a propaganda machine. And propaganda works. What the, what the data that we have so far suggests is it's not filter bubbles, all that. The people are somewhat in filter bubbles, but the fact is people on the left and the right are all getting exposed to tons of mainstream news. Tons. They're getting exposed to a lot. People, you, it's, you know, whatever you're reading, no one is reading only Breitbart or only the Daily Cons. People are still looking at the New York Times or watching CBS News or whatever. But they are suffused at the same time with all this stuff depending on which size around that, the only word for it is propaganda, misinformation, disinformation. It's not the like fake, fake news, you know, the Trump, that uh, the Pope endorsed Trump. It's the take a real fact and twist it and distort it and embed it in emotional anger-making frame, and, and that changes people, right? Nazi, the Nazis, there was plenty of good news in Germany in the 1920s, but the Nazi propaganda machine worked anyway to persuade millions of Germans to believe things that were fairly detached from reality, and that's where we are today. So that problem needs to be addressed, because even if the government begins to function, if what people hear and believe just isn't that, then we're not going to solve our problems. And the source of that problem is the social media platforms, we think. So what, let me just, I'll do this really quickly, but and it's, this is more for First Amendment people. Um, our traditional norm rights, like the right to free speech, they rest on explicit cost-benefit analyses and implicit cost-benefit analyses. The explicit cost-benefit analysis would be something like, yes, we believe in free speech, but not, you know, there is a point where it goes too far. You can't screen fire in a crowded theater, yada, yada, yada. So we limit the rights in all that way based on this kind of explicit balancing. But they always rest as well on an implicit balancing, which we're not aware of because it comes from the world that we live in. I'll give you a non-speech example. In the 19th century, there was a law of torts for accidents on the highway. And it had all the familiar doctrines. It had negligence and duty and, and proximate cause and all that. And, and there was explicit arguments that we made about how it applies in this case or that case. But it also rested on the fact, unaware, that not that many people were getting hurt in accidents on the highway because there weren't that many people on the highway and they were moving pretty slowly because it was still horses and buggies. The car comes along and suddenly everything changes. And you can't just take those 19th century doctrines and apply them as if it were the same situation in a situation where you've got lots more people moving lots faster with much worse accidents. That was true for all of tort law. Right? So we actually changed the law to conform to a new reality and, and developed a new explicit cost-benefit analysis which rests on our current technology. Same thing is true for speech. So we have these doctrines, for instance, like the solution to bad speech is more speech. Brandeis said that. Okay? Everybody knows that's ridiculous. The solution to bad speech isn't more speech. The solution to bad speech, though, is that there not be too much of it. And the fact was the 20th century technology made it so that without even being aware of it, we had a world in which most people were not exposed to very much bad speech. Why? Because the production was such that the news producers and the news distributors were the same, and they acted pretty responsibly. Think of it this way. Imagine if 1964, and somebody comes to you and says, I have this great story. Lyndon Johnson is running a child trafficking operation out of a pizza parlor here. i got to get this out. Well, how would you do that in 1964? Your only chance to reach a mass audience would have been to go to the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS, and they would have shown you the door. Because, not because they only ran stuff by their own reporters, but they were not going to run a bullshit, ridiculous story that was crazy. You could have self-published, but, you know, ten people would have seen it because you wouldn't have the resources to reach anybody. There were some extremist outlets. You could have gone to the Communist Party, you could have gone to the John Birch Society, they might have run your story, and then a few more people would have seen it, the people who went looking for the John Birch paper or the Communist Party paper, but very few. As a result, very little of that stuff actually ever reached people. So we could indulge in our things, because in fact the technology was protecting us in ways we weren't. The net comes along, combined with social media, and now if I have that story, I can produce it myself at a really high level of quality, really cheap, I can put it on the internet, and I can reach a mass audience really easily. And that's because the news producers are still out there, CBS, New York Times, but they're no longer the distributors. The distribution function has been shifted down to the social media, and they don't curate in the way that the traditional news media did. They let anything through that anyone in your network is willing to pass along. 
And the result is people who wouldn't go looking for that because they weren't going to go buy the Communist Party paper would suddenly come into their news feed and they're getting suffused in it. So we need a solution to that. There's some ideas out there. We can talk about that later. I won't go into it. The other new piece that I'm really most interested in myself, and I talked to Fred about this earlier, is so what, what I've talked about are two things in politics. One is the media and the information environment in which people hear about what's happening. The other is the capacity of politicians themselves to do things. But there is a third piece, which is they need ideas. They need answers to our problems. And the fact of the matter is we're kind of dead end in terms of how to deal with the problems that we have because the intellectual framework that we have is itself dead. So what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm going to do an imagine now it's 1945, not 1964. 1945 and you're Milton Friedman. Okay, young note, Friedman. What do you believe? You believe that society is best understood as atomized individuals rationally competing to maximize their own interests. At the other end, and you, by the way, you think that that's not just descriptive of society. There is no such thing as society. There's only individuals, and they compete to advance their own interests. You think that, to you, that's the very definition of liberty, right? A, a society that has freedom is a society that lets individuals compete to maximize their interests in a free market. At the other end, you believe, what's the best measure of success for a society? Well, the best measure of success for a society is wealth. The more wealth a society has, the better the society is off, right? Better more than less. Believing those two things, then you have a whole program for the role of government, which is the role of government is not laissez-faire, it's not do nothing. It's build and protect markets so that rationally competing individuals can maximize the amount of wealth that's generated. But it's 1945 and everybody else in the world thinks you're a batty, lunatic fringe player. Because everybody else in the world has just come out of the Great Depression. And they said, you know what? That do nothing thing or only use free markets thing, that doesn't work out well. We need something different. And the different, of course, is John Maynard Keynes. Keynes says, no, right? There are all these big fluctuations. The government has to manage the economy a little bit through monetary and fiscal policy. We need that. And that's what everybody else believes. Now, there's, lots of, there's a left and a right within the Keynesian frame. They disagree with each other a lot about exactly how and when and to what extent government should do what it does. But there they are. Okay. Now flash forward 40 years. It's now 1985 and you're Milton Friedman and you believe exactly the same things, but now you're the mainstream. And everybody thinks like you do. There are people on the left and people on the right. They still disagree a lot. But the notion that we start with markets, that that's the best device for figuring stuff out, that we interfere to the minimum extent possible, is shared on the left and the right. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama... They see more market failures that justify some intervention, but it's always an exception to a free market, which is our best solution. So that's why the Affordable Care Act looked the way it did. That's why John Frank looked the way it did, the earned income tax credit. You, Milton Friedman, have become the new consensus within which the left and the right disagree. How did that happen? So part of it was circumstances changed, where your ideas didn't make any sense to people coming out of the Great Depression. They made lots of sense to people coming out of the 1960s. In the 1960s, that managed economy is not managing so well. Unemployment is high, interest rates are high, inflation is through the roof, stagflation, you know, oil crisis, you know, nothing is working right. And in the meantime, that government management stuff has spread from fiscal and monetary policy to everything, the family, the, the, the environment, the, the every sector, insurance, 